Go back six, seven years ago when you began talking about what you envisioned as this exhibit becoming. You know, it started probably earlier than that as far as in my mind in what we needed to do to move the museum forward. It's like anything else. It's building a business. It's building stories. It's telling the people, the community about history. And so probably in 2009, in my mind, I'd been here a year. I started mapping out a way to do some different things. And one of the things that I wanted to do more than anything was a top-notch military exhibit. Then about seven years ago, we started raising money for it. And keep in mind, when you're fundraising, whether it's $10, $10,000, or $100,000, every penny is important. Veterans Hall is a opportunity for any family to honor one of their veterans. The only caveat to that is they at some time need to have lived in Anderson County. The cost of one of the blocks is $250. It is an ongoing fundraising effort for the museum. So we invite people to continue buying a block and helping us continue to maintain the military exhibit. Once you see it, you're going to be amazed. With your block purchase, you also get your veteran in the kiosk and pull up their name in the kiosk and you can see their bio, their photos, and it tells a little bit about their service. If you're interested in purchasing a block, you can certainly call the museum at 864-260-4737 or you can check out our website, andersoncountymuseum.southcarolina.gov. There are so many unique things about this exhibit, but I do think one of the special things about this exhibit is that Don Chapman of Chapman Design Group he designed the, the floor plan to enter and to exit Veterans Hall. Most of Veterans Hall is black and white, and the only color in Veterans Hall is the branch medallions of each branch of service. Then as you look at the end of Veterans Hall, you see an American flag, and overhead you see the sky looking down on each branch of service. First off, I'll say that I've never been more proud in my 30 years to design a space for the veterans. Being from a, a military family, my dad's name is right there. The vision I had was to design it where that it truly celebrated the veterans past and present and give us the freedoms that we're allowed to enjoy today. As you exit Veterans Hall, you then go into the right and you go toward the Revolutionary War. The scene that we're looking at here was meant to depict the signing of the Hopewell Treaties in 1785 underneath the Treaty Oak. The reason this is such a significant signing was that it solidified the lands that would become the new state of South Carolina. It was also meant to be the start of a beneficial relationship between the Native Americans who were present and the new state of South Carolina, the new government of the United States. I will say that about 90% of the artifacts that you'll see in here are authentic. We did purchase a few weapon replicas where we needed to, especially for some of the earlier conflicts. But even for the Revolution, we have some pieces that are altered original weaponry from the Revolutionary era. Heading into the Orr's Rifles camp, uh, we do have a mannequin sitting here who is wearing a uniform that would be typical of what the Orr's Rifles would have been wearing after about 1862. There's also a reproduction tent here that would have been typical of something that a common soldier might have stayed in, even two soldiers sleeping in, in a tent that size. Ledbetter was born in Townville and he's got a really interesting story in that he never really knew his son who was born right before he went to the fight in the Civil War. And this was something that lived with his son who was D.A. Ledbetter Jr. He never knew his dad, didn't know where he was buried. So later on in life, he happens to stumble across a line in a poem that directly references where D.A. Ledbetter lies. 
So Junior takes it upon himself to look up the author of the poem, W.A. Buckley, who's pictured behind me over here. And uh, the two of them were able to locate the grave and take some artifacts from the grave, which include the epaulet that's uh, here original from D.A. Ledbetter's uniform. And the family also held on to a shotgun that we um, are excited to have be, be a part of this exhibit. So Anderson also has a really interesting reconstruction story that's in some ways typical, in other ways not so much. One interesting thing that happened was the federal pillage of Anderson in 1865 following the war. The city got pretty lucky in terms of damage when compared to places like Columbia or different places in Georgia. But what did happen is that the federal troops were targeting a Confederate treasury location that had been housed in Johnson Female Seminary. And they wanted to destroy the equipment and make sure that no more Confederate currency was going to be printed. One of the byproducts of this is that stationary paper from the treasury blew all over town and was gathered up by the residents because of the paper shortage that was going on. They wanted to write their families. One of the pieces that we have that you can kind of see what was going on is in Emily Reed's diaries where she has written over top of her own handwriting so many times in different directions, making the most of every square inch of paper that she had to tell the story of Anderson's reconstruction experience. As we head into the World War I section from the Civil War, you'll notice the trench walls that kind of come up around you and sort of swallow you up and the mud on the ground. The trenches were certainly something that was considered typical characteristic even of the World War I era. One of the things I always like to point out over here are some original artifacts from Hill 188, which was the location where Anderson local Freddie Stowers lost his life in service to the country. And those items were found via metal detector. He's particularly of interest to Anderson County history because he's the only Medal of Honor recipient from the county. And in national history, he is one of two African-American recipients from World War I. Directly following World War I, there were already attempts being made to commemorate the World War I soldiers who had served. And Doughboy statues began to pop up all over the nation. And this is ours from Anderson, but you'll notice that he's got some unique qualities about him. This particular statue was pulled down in 2008. A lot of Anderson residents remember the incident well. Suspected metal thieves that were trying to take him away, but when they realized what he was comprised of and how much he weighed, they decided it was just easier to leave him laying. So the pieces came to the museum at that time, and the Legion building on 81, where he once stood, now has a replica um, statue that has been reinstalled. And we incorporated, or I guess you could say recruited, the help of Scott Foster. And this is one of his great ideas of making our vision of the soldier being put back together but not completely healed. All the damage is still there and visible. Scott made the comment that you don't know if he's coming together or going apart. The World War II section ended up being one of our largest sections uh, physically and has quite a number of stories that we like to highlight. One of those being the story of the two Orr brothers. The two brothers, they grew up together in Anderson, but they would serve on opposite sides of the globe during World War II. And uh, they had limited information about where each other were. Uh, Sam, on the left, he worked in intelligence. He was at Bletchley Park in London for a while in England. He also would serve in a number of different countries in the European theater and even Northern Africa. Meanwhile, his brother Bill was in the Philippines and became a part of the Bataan Death March. He did survive the march, and the two brothers were later reunited back in Anderson after having not seen each other for the entirety of the war. But these two women are very special Andersonians in that they were in the thick of everything. Jewel Esmacher was a, what they called a code girl. She was in intelligence and worked to decode messages and provide that intelligence to the government. Probably saved countless U.S. lives in that work. And another is Mary Evelyn Crenshaw. She was a Pendleton native, a nurse, and she became a commander in the Navy, which at this time would be of extraordinarily high rank to achieve as a woman in the military. Some of you might be familiar with the nickname that was given to the Korean War. It's called the Forgotten War. Part of the reason for that is that the Korean War was not recognized as a formal conflict 
for a number of years. This is a great place to highlight them and their experiences. One of the people that we talk about is Eli Latham. He was from Iva area and he was a cook. He had the opportunity to cook the entire Thanksgiving dinner for his base in California, which was for thousands of people at Mather Air Force Base. And there's a picture here of a silk cloth that he sent back from Korea to his wife back in Iva just to let her know that he was thinking about her while he was overseas. A lot of Anderson County veterans had never left um, their homes until they joined the service. And we hear that all the time, quotes like, I had joined so that I could see the world, or I had never left Anderson County until Vietnam. These are situations where you're totally removed from everything you're comfortable with, and you go to a place with rainy seasons and dry seasons and extreme heat and humidity, extreme cold. You've even got some critters here on the floor that are crawling around. We highlight a couple of different people in the exhibit, including Johnny Evans and David King, local Andersonians, many of which are, still have huge impacts in the community and had very interesting stories. For instance, David King flying a Huey helicopter and providing cover for transport copters that would be moving troops. And he had a lot of different stories about times that he wasn't sure how the mission was going to end. Just try to imagine as a 19 year old being in those situations where you weren't sure whether or not you were coming back to base that night. We kind of have a trajectory in the exhibit of changing technologies as well. So that's one of the things that is more evident in here is that we've now got equipment that is specifically made for different environments. One of the people that we like to highlight in here is William Chad Funk who served in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, part of his work was to work with groups of local Iraqis to teach them the basics of construction so that they could rebuild homes and schools and infrastructure and things like that. Another interesting thing about him is that he was a musician and he was part of a, a band that was made up of different members of his unit, a bluegrass band called the Baghdad Bad Boys, they said. And they had their own theme song, they had stickers, they recorded a CD together, and it's just a, a really interesting way that he was able to bond with the guys in his unit and bring home some of those memories and also bring some of his home with him wherever he went during his service. We want people to be removed. I have initiated a plan which will end this war in a way that will bring us closer to that great goal. From where they are, when they come in here and feel like they're going to these different places. A date which will live in infamy. This is a permanent exhibit and we look at permanent exhibits as about a 30 year exhibit. Now that's not to say artifacts will not move in and out of this exhibit. We will add artifacts when they come in the door. We have over 26,000 artifacts that this museum owns. We're a collecting museum. So therefore, it'll be around for a long time and we invite our community to come in and see what we have done here. I am so proud that I work for a county that believes in preserving history. Not every county does. We have a free admission museum because Anderson County preserves their history.